Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Power, Process, and Marine Division President Gerhard Salinger. Thank you very much and good morning. I hope you had a good evening yesterday. Good. This is an amazing resort, isn't it? It's wonderful. As you have seen yesterday and heard, uh, I am with uh, Intergraph, I'm with Hexagon. I'm very excited about the new ownership. Hexagon, as Intergraph, is a high-tech, technology-driven company. And um, I met their management team and can say I like them. And I'm really looking forward to be a member of the Hexagon family. OK, um, let's start. So for, uh, there's about 800, maybe 820. I don't have the final numbers yet, but over 800 people from all over the world, from 35 countries attending this conference. There are uh, about 670 customers and 150 maybe uh, PPM employees attending here, uh, attending six keynotes, 55 presentations, 25 workshops, and 12 <laughs> training sessions. Thank you very much for coming here, specifically on the relatively late change we were forced to make, uh, moving this from uh, Nashville to here, which I understand did create a couple of uh, travel challenges for, for some of you. So thank you very much for being here, and I hope you uh, enjoy it, and I hope you learn and see what you want to and hope to see. My today's presentation is basically divided into three parts. Number one, and very brief, I will give you an update on a few numbers which might be interesting or relevant to you. And this will be very short because you have heard about Intergraph performance yesterday in Mr. Weiss' presentation already. Um, the next thing I'll do is uh, I hope that you join me in congratulating the Golden Wealf Award winners, which are represented here. And the third part, which is the, uh, the, the biggest uh, and most important element of this presentation, is a roundtable discussion I'll have with uh, some famous industry experts where we will talk and discuss what technology, and specifically Intergraph technology, can do to make plant design and operations a little bit more safe. Okay, let me start with a few numbers. So this is a view on the on our financial PPM's financial performance between the beginning of last year and the mid of this year. So what you see here are basically six quarter uh, revenue results since early last year. And as you can see, the crisis did impact us as well as many other companies, but it did hit us relatively moderate and relatively short. So our revenue went down by approximately seven or eight uh, percent during two quarters, Q2 and Q3 of last year, but we already came back again in the last quarter of last year with a pretty nice growth, and this continued in 2010. It must be said that the 2010 numbers, the last two quarters you see here, are including revenue from two companies we did acquire in last year, and I will talk about that in detail a little bit more. Uh, we, we acquired two companies, one from the US, Kuwait, and a company from Germany, uh, Seagraph. 
But still, as you can see, we are back on stage, and uh, from all I can see and hear, the outlook for the remainder of this year and the following years uh, is very positive. So thank you again for this, because we fully know that it is you, your trust, and your investments in our technology and people who made this happen. We continued, uh, even in some uh, harder conditions last year, we continued to invest and grow our investment in R&D. And as you can see, in this year, R&D investments in software development uh, goes up by more than 10%. If you look at our product portfolio, I divided this in three pieces. The first piece is intelligent 2D solutions, which means smart plant PNID, smart plant instrumentation, and smart plant electrical. And as you can see here, within the last five years, the numbers of seats or licenses is continuous, continuously going up and is reaching the number of 34,000. And these 34,000 does not include approximately 2,000 additional seats uh, we, we did acquire from uh, this German company Seagraph I mentioned earlier. Uh, so including those, it would be 36,000. The, uh, the little reduction you saw in, or see in 2009 is basically from uh, lease seats we have. So cu some customers reduced due to uh, low workload, um, reduced the number of seats lease seats for uh, a period of time, but again, this is back on track and growing. The second group of products I'm looking at is the new 3D solutions, meaning smart plant 3D, as well as the offshore and shipbuilding solutions, smart marine 3D. And again, since 2005, the number of, that, of the, these seats has more than tripled. What I really see and hear every day from uh, customers and uh, my own international organization is that we are at that point we hoped to be uh, for some time, uh, and I would call this the avalanche. The avalanche to come, meaning that a large number of customers are starting and have already started to use this breakthrough technology in their projects, in large projects, mega large projects uh, today. And um, the only thing we need to worry about is to make sure that we will have the proper services and support capacities in the regions to serve all of you who are starting this great, to use this great technology properly. Because as you know, our rule number one is never ever let the customer down. That's, your, that's my promise and our promise to you. And for this, we need to be properly staffed. And we are working hard on doing that. The third product group I want to highlight is data management as well as materials management. Um, and as you can see, as of today, we have more than 400, I believe it's close to 430 customers who did adopt or started to use Smart Plant Foundation or Smart Plant Foundation for owner operators. Last year at the, at the customer conference in Washington DC, I did announce that we did reach uh, or broke the 300 customer barrier. So since uh, May or June of last year, when we have been in Washington DC, there's 125 or 130 additional customers within 15 months. And if you calculate that, uh, you will find that this means approximately two new customers adopting this technology and these solutions every week. And that's tremendous. And again, I repeat myself, I know, but uh, again, I want to thank you for this level of trust you've given us in our solutions. I mentioned that we did uh, two acquisitions 
recently. And uh, as mentioned, one of those companies we acquired is Houston-based Coaid. Coaid does basically two products or two product lines. One is uh, the pipe analysis product line uh, led by the prominent and market leading solution CESAR 2. And many of you, I think, are using CESAR 2 since many, many years successfully in your plant operations. So CESAR 2 is now part of the Intergraph product family. The other product line they have is a product named Catworks. And Catworks is a 2D, 3D plant design system uh, based on AutoCAD. And um, I believe, and I'm told, uh, the best of its type in its class. Uh, as you know, there is a couple of other products from uh, competitors in this, in this um, level, if you like. But Catworks is uh, a very good solution. And I can encourage you uh, to take the time to talk to us uh, to, uh, to learn more about it. We show it down in the, in the uh, presentation hall. Um, it's pretty good. It also is very tightly linked to some of Hexagon's products, specifically the laser scanning solution they have and Hexagon offers through their Leica division. The other product uh, company we bought is uh, from a German company named Seagraph, and this is basically an, an extension or an add-on to our electrical software solutions, Matblad Electrical. This product does very, very great in uh, electrical detail design. So those of you who are not do only electrical basic design, but detail design, or plan to do so in the future, I strongly recommend you to look at it because it's a very good solution. And uh, it's recently re renamed uh, from uh, Seagraph to Smartplant Electrical Detail. Okay, and it's a great enhancement to our 2D, intelligent 2D uh, solutions for you. Okay, that's it from the number side. Next thing is I would like you to join me in congratulating all the Golden Wealth winners represented here. And you might have seen that already. The best of show this year is from a Chinese company. The first time, by the way, that a Chinese company did win the first prize here. So thank you very much to all of you who uh, attended and all of your work and uh, pictures you send us are, are great. And we had you know, some discussions which is really the best because many are so good. But anyway, one must win and the winner this year is China Petroleum Construction and Engineering Corporation. And uh, please stand up, gentlemen, ladies, and, and uh, please stand up and please give them a hand. Thank you very much for this. Okay, as I have said, the third part of this uh, hour will be a, will focus on plant safety and on ways how to increase plant safety through new or better technology. And this is an open discussion, and to be honest with you, uh, we do not claim to have all answers as of today. So uh, we want to share with you what we are thinking and in which direction we are going and what technology could do. But I know that there is much, much more we do not know today. Uh, so we learn about the potential this technology offers day by day with, with each uh, discussion we have with customers or our own experts new ideas, new ways. Um, plant safety has always been a key topic 
for both engineering as well as plant operations. No doubt about that. But we all have seen what can happen if uh, things go wrong, right? We all have all the pictures still in mind about this burning platform uh, which finally did sink in the oil spill uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, it seems that uh, due to the investigations going on, uh, more and more uh, is going to be uncovered, more and more on the, on the reasons happen. And it seems it's a chain reaction of a couple of things which, uh, which went wrong. Uh, so the question mark is, what can be done to avoid that to happen ever again. And again, I'm not saying we have the answers here on that, but what I say is we have some technology we believe can help on this area, and I ask you all to think about that, listen to the discussion we'll have, uh, and give us your view, allowing us and helping us to do better for all of our life. So I'm, let me show, so before we start, let me show you this thing. This is a statement being made by our largest customer worldwide, largest in the sense of the number of uh, 3D seats being used. This is Samsung Heavy Industries in Korea. Samsung is using our technology, Smart Marine 3D, for the, and in their shipbuilding division with uh, more than 1,100 seats and building 60, and as I've heard yesterday, plan to build 70 large and very complex ships um, next year. And they also made a decision to extend the use of this technology in their offshore group, which so far did use a competitive system. Samsung made a decision to replace that system by our technology. And what uh, Samsung is saying that this solution and the rule-based design capability it offers allows them to increase the quality and safety of their ships and offshore structures tremendously. The number and level of design er errors, manufacturing errors, goes down and did go down dramatically compared to their previous technologies they have been used. And this, is, and this is one aspect, and we'll cover that in the, in, the, in the forthcoming discussion, but this is one aspect of safety, right? And better technology. If you, if you have systems which allow you to build uh, error-free, or at least reduce the number of design errors uh, by factors, it is itself a strong safety effect because uh, design errors not detected early normally you, uh, lead to changes and corrections to be made in the construction phase, on the construction side or in the yard. And this is not only costly, this is also a safety risk because these late changes being made in many cases are not properly um, communicated. And so uh, at the end of the day, the owner gets a plant or a ship or whatever it is, which works, but is not exactly what has been designed. So there is a difference, right? Because uh, late changes might not be properly documented and, and communicated. And uh, this as itself is not a cost factor only, right, as you can imagine, but a safety factor and risk. And this is just one aspect, right? But there's much more and we will talk about that and hopefully get some, uh, some good ideas and answers to that in the next uh, half an hour or so. Okay, this is basically a computer simulation, I believe. Um, so nobody must be embarrassed by that, it's a uh, fiction. But uh, still, you know, everybody wants to avoid something like that, of course. Okay. Um, let me now ask Mr. Patrick Holcomb from Intergraph PPM come on stage. Patrick is reporting to me and he's my man. He's responsible for our business uh, development group 
Welcome, Patrick. Thank you, Gerhard. <laughs> I'm always nice, I know. <laughs> For those of you that know me, uh, you know that I get very excited about finding ways to change our business with technology, not so much the technology itself. Uh, it's been a wonderful opportunity over the past years as we've seen this really begin to change as, as people move from old CAD systems, which were really uh, you know, about very basic productivity enhancements, but didn't really contribute to real intellectual property automation so much. They really just automated a, a, a paper drafting process. However, with newer technology, like the Smart 3D technology, we're starting to see that these applications, this technology, is beginning to play a bigger role in intellectual property and logic control. Uh, one of the things that we've started to see recently is opportunities to use that kind of technology, not just for productivity, but also for safety and quality. Uh, that kind of technology, because it's both data-centric and rules-driven, starts to create opportunities for, for clients and for the industry that just didn't exist before. It's really about playing our role in continuous improvement of the industry. And so I would like to show you a couple of examples of where data-centric and rules-driven technology starts to make a real uh, tangible difference in the safety, quality, and productivity of the plants that we create. Uh, first of all, I'd like to show you a short video uh, this is a, uh, a simulation by a company called Gexcon, and they do gas dispersion and explosion analysis. So you see there's some gas dispersion, and then also you can see uh, a, a quick depiction here of uh, an explosion pressure wave analysis done on a 3D model. Now those are typical uh, functions that are done for different types of plants depending on the situation. And I think many of you are probably more, even more familiar with that than I am, but looking at particularly in enclosed places, how does gas disperse, what are the risks, and where does the risk of ignition stop, and what are the impacts, if there is an ignition, what are the impacts? And so it gives an ability for a designer to think through how, how they're going to design walls, the strength of walls, how closed the space should be or should not be, in order to make good engineering decisions to improve the safety of the plant. What we did with Smart3D, because it's a data-centric application, we were able to, for a client, in only two weeks, so for a short two-week services project, we were able to build a direct interface with this application, Gexcon. What that means is we've, we've added to productivity because now there's no remodeling. So the, uh, the Gexcon an analyst or user no longer has to create a, a, a 3D model over and over again. Now that's important from a productivity perspective and I think that's pretty obvious, but it also has a safety and quality impact. Because that person, has now their barrier has been removed, it's much easier and much faster to run iterations. We all know that it's very difficult to get one's hands on the final 3D model before construction starts. And so what this allows that person to do is they can be, then go by iteration by iteration and they can very quickly look at different changes to the plant that may impact their design. And so that's just a, a nice piece of flexibility that happens when you're using data-centric technology like this. The second one I'd like to show you in a moment uh, is gonna depict how rules start to play a role on top of that data-centric technology. By having rules, in the past we've frequently thought about that also for productivity purposes alone. So how can we automate more things that designers do, but we've we haven't really thought so much about the safety and quality aspects of how rules can change the design of our plant and really make them safer and higher quality. So let me show you a, uh, a short video of how this would work. Uh, as, as, many of you, uh, as many of you know, you can uh, use Smart Plant 3D and you can change designs and this is all quite normal. In this case, you see a designer uh, placing a valve from the PNID. Uh, the safety classification is transferred over and this is normal you know, productivity enhancing uh, capability. What we're showing you now is the designer is firing off a hazardous area design rule checker. Now that design rule checker is gonna go through the entire plant, hundreds and hundreds of pieces of equipment, making sure that all of our hazardous area classifications are appropriately matched and meet the criteria. When we run this, you can see here, within the gas dispersion limits that, are now created, that have now been changed by the placement of that valve, you can see we've got a NEMA box, an electrical box, that's showing red. So 
the NEMA rating is now not correct because the placement of that valve, which could be a potential source of leak of gas or liquids, so the, the placement of that valve is now too close to a box that's not rated appropriately. Now, it's important to realize that that's a cross-discipline solution. So you've got an electrical discipline there and you've got a piping discipline. And those are the kind of mistakes that are very easy to make in the real world, particularly on large, complex projects. What you're seeing now is the, once the designer has been notified by the automatic rule checker, so the designer can go in, evaluate what the problem is, and begin to look at you know, how do they change that, the options of do they move the box, do they change the classification of the box, do they move the valve, so the different options that the designer can use. At this point in the design, very cheap to make that change, a few dollars of engineering and design time. Now, if we waited until someone caught this far down in the process during a safety audit, it could be much more expensive, particularly if it got into construction or even procurement planning. But with this, we've, changed, we've, made, we've caught the change when it's cheap to catch it, back up early in design where it costs only a few dollars to make the change. And we've, we've ensured not just the safety of this one little change, because this is an, a very isolated example, but we've gone through an entire plant, which might be a multi-billion dollar facility, and we've checked the hazardous area classification of thousands of pieces of equipment. And I know for a fact, if any of you go through projects that you've been on today, there have been a few little mistakes that have slipped through the cracks because of all the changes that happen from the different disciplines or perhaps different companies uh, over the course of a project. And so this kind of technology starts to automate that and make that so that we can catch those mistakes in, and really help people with the complexity of plants today. The point with this is that uh, rules in a rule-based system as our sm uh, smart 3D products are cannot only be used to increase productivity and quality of the plant, as we have heard from uh, Samsung, but rules also can be safety related. Rules can be watchdo watchdogs, if you like, safety related watchdogs, as in this little example, would uh, bark, if you like, saying, hey, this is not allowed, you are, uh, you are uh, violating uh, a rule, designer, please take care. Something cannot be that way, right? And, um, you know, these rules, this is nothing new. They all exist, but they exist in paper form in most cases, right? In handbooks and regulations, either from the EPC companies themselves or the owner operators or regulatories. They all are there. The point is that they are in books and which guarantee is there that a designer are using and looking all of those safety related rules? There's no guarantee that he does and he might violate safety related rules not by bad intention but by you know overseeing things especially today when the, when the, when the plants built today are much much bigger and much much more complex than they, than they ever have been and still growing. Uh, and since the world is changing in the, in the type of plants, the number of plants, complexity of plants being built, I think it is needed to think about new technology, new ways to deal with this, because uh, you would not build a plant uh, today of a, a you know, cost of, let's say, five or 10 billion and extremely comple extreme complexity with tools from the 60s or 70s, right? You don't want to do that. And the question mark is how to use new technology in the most efficient way. Okay, so I think it's time for the- So now we would, uh, we'd like to start a, uh, a round table discussion with some esteemed industry experts. Uh, if we could uh, welcome them up to the stage, please. Ladies and gentlemen, joining Mr. Salinger and Mr. Holcomb on stage are Russ Novak of ARC Advisory Group, Raul Hermosillo of Independent Project Analysis Incorporated, and Joe Murray of Trinity Technologies. So. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Joe Murray. Uh, it is a uh, truly a pleasure and an honor so to be able to uh, moderate this very, very important topic of safety. 
and equally important Mr. how Chairman. the Intergraph solutions, the Intergraph technology can help. Before we get started, I wanted to just clarify and maybe ask Patrick a question, because it, it's very intriguing, that last uh, video that we saw. Patrick, just to help us all understand, um, how long did it take to create those rules, and could those be, could we have any kind of rules? How, how broadly applicable is what we just saw? That rule was uh, less than two weeks of man effort for that specific rule type. And it, the most important part is it was done on uh, our version 2009 technology. So it was not new technology, it was just new rules applied on that rules engine. And that, there's no limit. So uh, hazardous area classification are, is only one example of the kind of rule that can be done. It could be a, a design automation, it can be a quality checker, it could be a consistency checker. There are just so many different rules that happen and, and requirements. All these rules exist today in the owner's specifications or in uh, specific industry specifications. And we can begin to take that out of the paper process and really start to put it into a, a real electronic automated process to help people. I think uh, just in that two minutes, I could just see the game-changing nature of what we just saw. So very, very interesting. Well, um, why don't we start off the question, and we have uh, two very, very uh, experienced and esteemed uh, analysts from the industry. Let me start the question and invite everybody. Um, safety has always been a very, very important part of our job, whether we're an EPC company, whether we're an owner company, and obviously it's always been paramount in the value proposition that Intergraph has delivered. I'd like to start the questions, though, by saying the events of the last few months um, has certainly brought a renewed focus on the issue of both construction and process safety, so both the construction side and the operation side. I wonder if you could comment, has things changed? What is different? And how do we look at safety today from a market perspective? Russ, do you want to start off? And yeah, I, uh, I think there's probably three approaches to this, three perspectives. First of all, within uh, each company, I think there's a much more prevalent need to be very thoughtful about your risk assessment and to review your processes. And this certainly is uh, in conjunction with a, an approved uh, global safety system, safety program, because these programs are dynamic. They're, they're subject to change. They look at the history and the incidents of your entity as well as other people in the industries, and they will be modified and upgraded. Uh, secondly, uh, from the perspective of what's going on in the world, typically a safety program reflects industry best practices, uh, specifications, recommendations, and often the government has recommendations of what to do. Uh, that is changing. The rest, some of the recommendations are not just recommendations anymore. They've morphed into compliance, into regulations. And in particular, I'm referencing here things like hazards analysis, your review of your operating practices, mechanical and operational integrity, very important. And of course, underlying all those is the management of change issues. So it's no longer should we or it's a good idea to, it's thou shalt. And companies have to have that reflected in their safety program. And I think the third, the third perspective one to look at is not just within your own corporation or your own company. You may have good access, good safety programs, reliable data, but now in today's world, you're probably partnering on a global basis perhaps with other groups. They may be working from a different set of rules or different versions of that information. So it's imperative that you work with your partners to everybody be on the same page, have the same perception of what the reality is that you're facing. And again, that deals with having a good set of engineering tools so that everybody has that same set of information on a timely basis. Very good. Thank you, Russ. Ro, what, uh, what's your, from an IPA perspective, uh, what is, uh, what's your view? So as you know, IPA, Independent Project Analysis, is a data-driven research company. We're totally dedicated to empirical research on capital projects and turnarounds. We don't want to manage them. We don't want to execute them. We do research. We collect about 800 projects a year from $250,000 to multi-billion dollar project. We're a company of data and databases. When we look at the data, and, and I'll be sharing some more this morning in a, one of the sessions this morning on construction readiness. When you look at the data, the data suggests that there's a lot of integrity and quality issues that have the potential to lead to major safety disasters. 
If you look at the data, 50% of our projects that we look at on a yearly basis incur some sort of a late major design change. Late being after full sanction, major being it costs at least half a percent of the project and impacts the schedule by a month. So th there's, a, there's a lot to be gained in the industry by having systems that help those avoid those errors. When Very I good. Patrick. Thank you, Roel. Patrick, uh, what's your observation in terms of uh, the focus, overall focus on safety that we need to have? Well, I, from a technology perspective, it, it's, changing our, it's changing our focus and really the value proposition. If you think about it, it long, long ago, the, our, all of our technology really started with a productivity argument. You know, that's the whole reason that AutoCAD and MicroStation replaced drafting tables. It was, it was all about productivity. And then after that, you started to see quality opportunities, such as a clash-free design, right? That was the core reason 3D has been adopted in the marketplace. And now you're starting to see safety come into play as the technology becomes more and more able to do, to execute and check more of the engineering and design logic. You're starting to see that safety is now becoming a major component of, the, uh, of what the technology brings. Yeah. I, I think that's an important takeaway, by the way, from just that first question, that safety is always, has been, and continues to be of paramount importance. But I think that the complexity, as Gerhardt mentioned in his talk, the complexity has gotten far greater. And the tools, therefore, required to be able to ensure safety have got to expand, have got to improve. And then, as Russ indicated, we're going from a, certainly this is an impact, potentially a regulatory environment that was suggestive to, in fact, is now prescriptive and mandatory. And so I, I think we do have clearly a game changer here. And I think, as Patrick and Gerhard have emphasized, this is something that, in fact, Intergraph has stepped forward to be able to address. So interesting starting point. Let's go on to the second question, um, and that is, all of us, whether we're in the EPC world or the owner world, are involved in projects which invariably are, as IPA calls them, schedule driven. Uh, nothing ever gets done when you normally want it. It's got to be done twice as fast. And as we start to bring in the questions of safety and what is the impact, and more importantly, what can we do in schedule driven systems to be able to ensure safety and be able to improve the results both, again, on a construction side and an operation side. I'd like the panel to maybe comment on specifically the question of how can we as an industry and how can Intergraph as a technology provider address this pervasive schedule-based projects through our technology? Ro, maybe you could comment on what the data has been to date. Well, as, as far as the data that we have uh, with IPA, when we, we differentiate schedule-driven projects from non-schedule-driven projects, schedule-driven being those that the project team, the owner is willing to pay to expedite the schedule, right, overtime or something, scheduled overtime. Uh, all projects of all sizes, in the United States, Canada, Europe, we don't see a statistical difference, obviously, and, and, and actually in the recordable injury rates or the, the days away transfer type rates. We do see a very different in, uh, in the quality integrity issues that I mentioned. A lot of design errors and simple errors, right, on the document that lead to rework that could possibly lead to a safety incident in the field because not everybody's aligned. The simple example I think that Patrick showed this morning of the electrical box. Right? It used to be most companies had that type of experience to recognize that instantly. A, a lot of the owners that we work with, and we work with global companies that you would recognize simply don't have that knowledge and experience in-house, and therefore a system like this could really help them avoid a major incident like that would have caused it. Very good, very interesting, yes. Russ. Yeah, I think uh, thinking back uh, to the days of, of uh, turnkey projects, uh, the most uh, dangerous phase is probably the commissioning startup. That's the interface where you've got a relatively inexperienced operating team dealing with untrue, uh, unproven and untried uh, set of physical assets. And the last thing in the world that team wants to face is a series of last minute changes. You know, you've based your approach, your startup procedures on a certain set of conditions. And to have those reflected in, in the real world with a difference because of an, a, a late engineering change is, is, not, is not good. Uh, it's unsafe. Uh, Compressed time schedules are basically the enemy of a well-established safety program. 
you know, the answer to that is indeed getting a, a set of engineering tools that can timely make those corrections early in the design phase, not at the last minute as you approach commissioning. Very good point. Gerhardt, uh, any comment on that issue or Patrick? Um, no, I think uh, you uh, exactly hit the points uh, we need to look at, right? Uh, so uh, I fully agree to what I've said here. Very good. Patrick, anything? Uh... We're, we're seeing clients are continuing to improve in this area over time. And you can look uh, at, at very low levels of improvement. In fact, even uh, application hosting has a quality aspect to it because it removes, it gets some consistency in a company and removes some of the creativity and, because that sort of creativity and changes all the time creates an opportunity for errors. And we're, so we're seeing uh, clients are focusing on that area. They're also focusing on being able to deploy faster. So virtualization and other technologies like that are being used so that the IT setup part is getting smaller and smaller and smaller so it is less disruptive and, and enables people to have more time in, in seats doing the real work to so be on time. It's interesting, uh, years ago, uh, my boss called me in and asked me a very simple question, when does rework occur? And I said, well, I don't know, when does rework occur? It's when you make a mistake. No, 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 he said, he said, Joe, rework occurs always at the end of the project when you're out of money, you're out of time, and you're out of patience. And so this correlation between rework and being able to, in fact, use the Intergraph technologies to be able to better plan, better execute construction, and the correlation to safety, to me, seems fairly self-evident. And so I think as we talk about safety here, and one of the things that's important that this panel is going to continue to highlight is that, in fact, the technology tools that are available to us to improve safety is not necessarily the straight line, but, in fact, all of the different areas that affect a project performance project quality, as Raul talked about, and therefore project safety. One of the things that I think we've all talked about over the last few years and that Intergraph has done a lot of work in and things like SPO is the asset, the information asset during operations. And I guess I'd like to ask, as we move down the life cycle and we look at, we've gone to construction, Russ, I wonder if you could comment on the safety aspects of commissioning as well as ongoing information uh, that is being managed for the, the operation of the plant. And can you bring us together on the safety side of this? I think uh, as, you, as you look through a, uh, across the life cycle of a, of a project, uh, when you talk about issues of safety and quality, and if, and if you're not indeed what you would term to be in perfect shape, it deals with the issue of uh, integrity. And I think owner operators today basically have to uh, recognize the responsibility for maintaining that integrity throughout the life cycle. You basically have to be able to demonstrate that, that uh, you designed this properly, that the procurement process indeed adhered to your specifications and rules, that it was constructed in a safe and orderly manner, that you've operated and maintained it, and be able to demonstrate this, frankly, through an audit trail. So the, the link to the asset information is very important, very important, and especially in this litigious society that we have. Uh, and when I say demonstrate, they have an audit trail, I don't mean that you would, we would uh, do it as a result of litigation in the discovery process. Yeah. Very good. Patrick, uh, comment on, on how you see the, uh, you know, the backside, the commission in operation, safety implications of the Intergraph technology. Well, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing a couple of changes in this area, Joe. Uh, there's a lot of experiments going on with the use of 3D technology in plant asset ma uh, management and information management. Uh, frequently that tends to be around uh, using some sort of a laser scan or photogrammetry approach to capturing the as-built of a plant. Uh, ironically, even uh, the Hexagon acquisition that we've had recently, quality came up as an opportunity. Hexagon, as many people know, makes many measurement devices. And I think uh, the, the study of metrology is not a well understood uh, art really in our industry. But they've got uh, laser scan and other types of measurement devices that do very precise measurement for manufacturing to ensure good quality. And none of that, was, that has really not been applied yet in our industry. And so that was one of the not immediate but more future opportunities that we're seeing there as well. Uh, one of the things that, uh, Russ, you commented on earlier, which I, I want to emphasize in this particular area, because I think it's important, 
The recent events and a lot of our history where we've had safety issues on the process side has been incorrect information. And I think both of you gentlemen mentioned the incorrect information does produce, in fact, safety hazards in many ways. And I think, Russ, you commented on the fact that by adhering to and having that integration of information so that you have the right information at the right time and that, in fact, it does reflect the current condition of the plant is extremely important in terms of achieving a safe operating condition. So the quality of the data, the quality of the information can, in fact, have a significant impact. So an important element as we drive through the technology and the various plant phases that we have. Next question I'd like to really address the pan have the panel address. Um, the realities are, in many of our industries, compliance, being able to demonstrate audible behavior that, in fact, you have adhered to, the requirements, the laws, the practices, uh, has become very, very important. The process industries, the power industries, clearly, and I think driven by the nuclear industry really leading the way, are going to create a, an increased need for being able to manage and to demonstrate compliance. And I wanted to see, maybe from an industry side, what are some of the areas that you see and validate what are the how can technology help us to be able to demonstrate compliance when that point comes, whether it be in a legal situation or a regulatory uh, aspect. I think the technology there would be important. Raul, comments on those. Well, you know, we, we still see the occasional project manager trying to manage the project cost on an Excel spreadsheet, right? And those strong legacy systems that existed 20, 30 years ago with a lot of our owners simply don't exist anymore. Right? And my, my point is that in part of our interview process in collecting data for a project, we sit down with that project team and we ask for evidence. Did you do this? Did you do that? Show me this, show me that. And more often than not, it's very difficult to have that traceability back to this is what we did at what point in time. Simple question. Though. So from our perspective, any technology that could help the project folks even create a repository of what they've done, right? much less maybe a repository of knowledge that was gained from that project, would be of great benefit to the industry. Because it just doesn't exist in, this, in, the, in the consistent form that you may think it does. We have a lot of different you know, online real-time systems that were probably implemented poorly and a lot of workarounds around that, and a lot of that gets just lost in the translation. Very good, thank you, good point. Russ. Yeah, I think you have to be able to share, uh, not only in the operational phase, but also your EPC partners. And again, it gets back to the having a repository of good data, you know, when we say good data, we're talking about it's, it's timely, it's complete, it's easily accessible uh, to the, the stakeholders in a secure manner. You know, you should be able to answer any, any question that is posed to it, including those that may come up in the, as a result of litigation. Yeah. Certainly, it's, uh, it brings it, it, it provides a vehicle, I guess, for us to be able to demonstrate that irrefutably that you have complied with the requirements that have been set forward. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Patrick, comment on, uh, on this area. You know, we've seen, a couple, we've seen a couple of places where this is starting to impact uh, our technology requirements. One of them, which uh, Charles and Evans and I will be discussing in the session that follows this, is around increasing the rigor of project change management. Uh, another one, which perhaps is uh, I perhaps a, a bad joke, is that uh, within our smart plant construction initiative, one of the questions that started to come up is how we can create recorded information and uh, recording uh, conversations so that we basically have better litigation trails because everyone knows that the attorney with the best paperwork at the end tends to win uh, when litigation does happen. So that's been a, one of the questions we got in smart plant construction also. Very good. Uh, this, is a, this is a very interesting area that each of the panelists have brought up and I, I just want to repeat it for emphasis. I think Raul's initial comment of saying traditionally we have had projects being managed by a project manager and that that individual was essentially directed the project. I think we are all very, very uh, familiar and recognize that in fact, the complexity of the projects today, both geographic dispersion as well as discipline and technology uh, dispersion, 
just does not allow the individual. And, and I think that one of the things that we're going to be looking at as we're looking at it in increasingly, and I, I'll speculate, an increasing regulatory environment, an increasing aggressive environment, that the ability to in fact show that those rules of best practices, those rules of safety are being instanced not just by a single individual or a single organization, but in fact they're pervasive in the rules. And I think this is an area that uh, in our company we do a lot of work in, in being able to demonstrate that in fact regulations and requirements are being adhered to. And doing it through the human is just very, very difficult. And I think we're going to see an aspect of that. that. Yes, Raul. Yeah. In addition to that, you know, we, we work with many companies and I'm painting with a broad brush, right? But in some instances, the role of the project manager has changed, right? You know, the, the title might be there or it might be some fuzzy title that only that person really knows what it means. But the role of project manager is not the kick butt type person we used to know in the past that knew everything about projects. Many times now you see a project manager, a construction manager, and they are much in a consulting role to teams of, of people trying to execute a project may or may not have experience doing that. Right? So any rules-based approach as to how to deliver that project and what you absolutely have to have in order to have a good project is nothing but a plus. No. And it would help tremendously drive the consistency of projects and perhaps deliver better projects. Very good. OK. Um, I guess I'd like to come back to kind of a, 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 a summary positioning. Um, as we said at the introduction that safety has always been important, but really today it has come to the forefront of everybody in this country, everybody in the world, truly, uh, in terms of its importance and both the economic as well as human risk inherent in not having a proper system that adheres to safety. I guess I'd like to get uh, some concluding comments in terms of where do you see the market going, where do you see the industry going, and what are some takeaways that we might have in terms of how technology can help us address all of the different areas that today in this complex world we can help to address safety? Russ, would you like to start it off? Yeah, as far as uh, just looking at it, uh, a quick summary for the, the best takeaway. We've, we're pretty well doing the same things uh, for 30, 40, 50, 100 years. We've been designing, building projects What and, and capital assets. What's What's really changed? Well, the world has changed. There, we now have global teams. The projects are much more comprehensive, co uh, complex, costly. And the old traditional tools that we've used simply can't meet the needs of the compressed time frame and increase, and, and increase costs of these projects. So you know, the answer is really you have to avail yourself of the one thing that has changed through the years, and that's the availability and the enablement of the new technology tools that capture this data, that make it available to all stakeholders throughout the asset of, uh, assets life cycle. Very good. Yeah. Raul. I'll answer that with a little bit of the, my IPA background and some personal experience background, if I may. I, I, I believe today most companies, American companies, I'll say that, are living out the strategies they put in place 20, 25 years ago. And that most American companies went through major downsizings of their functions. Right. The company I worked with, we were a function, engineering function of 3,600. We went to 1,200 during the course of a summer. We formed actual companies to take those displaced employees and maintain that experience and knowledge in our project system. Today, most of that knowledge and, and experience is gone because those people have retired. And, and, and a lot of companies have lost the capability to manage a, a, a project. They try to manage the process, but you can't manage the process if you don't know anything about the project you're building or the project itself. So. So my point in all this is, I believe some of this technology might even help bridge that gap in experience and knowledge until companies reestablish that, right? Where else do you have to go? Because you're not going to grow those people tomorrow. It takes a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge to become a proficient project manager, right? So the only thing, like, like Russ said, is the technology that's available forms a repository of data, experience, knowledge that other project teams can then count on. Very good. Thank you. Gerhardt, would you like to uh, provide a summary comment? I think uh, for, the, for the short period of time and uh, the short period of time we had for preparation on this, this is a pretty uh, good outcome. And, uh, and uh, I've learned a couple of things, and I'm 
very happy to get, uh, to get uh, that good feedback from, uh, from industry experts with a wealth of experience and know-how. So uh, I feel uh, you know, encouraged uh, because this tells me that uh, at least to some extent we are heading into the right direction and I'm looking forward to work with all of you uh, and all of you uh, in the future to make that happen and make this world a more safe place than ever before. Very good. Thank, Thank you, Gerhard. Patrick? The one thing I'd ask is that you begin to think differently. The technology has changed and the situation has changed. And there are opportunities that, to take advantage of that, like rules-driven technology that we're not very aware, well aware of today as an industry. I'd ask everybody to kind of begin to open your mind and become more aware of these types of technologies and how they can be leveraged to improve safety and quality in addition to productivity. Very good. So I think what we've heard, obey it in a very short period of time in 30 minutes, but we've seen the confluence and this panel has really addressed the bringing together of two key issues. One is, in fact, the continued and relentless pursuit of safety, both construction and operations. And with that, the recognition that the tools that we've used in the past, and all of these panelists have talked about this, the tools that we've used in the past may not, in fact, be fit for purpose for the complexity of the projects that we have today. So we do need to drive new ways to be able to ensure safety. And secondly, and five years from now, we'll see if, in fact, this is the case. But I'm, my, my suggestion is, in a uh, conference in which we have gotten used to game-changing technologies, where we heard about Smart Plant 3D, we heard about Smart Plant Foundation, we've heard about Smart Plant Operations, truly technology rule-changing, or sorry, market-changing situations. The use of rules, the integration of rules, the ability to configure rules within all of our different applications, I think will prove to be an important and substantial change to the way work gets done, the way the plant gets designed, the way the get plant gets built, the way the plant gets certified to, in fact, reflect that there is safety and how it is as an ongoing operational element. So what you've seen in this panel, the panel is about safety. But the message I think that the panelists have delivered is even more important, which is the technologies that we need to use to be able to support the, the, the scale of what we have to deal with continues to move forward. And the area of rules is not just about today design effectiveness. It is, in fact, fundamental to this industry being able to effectively and safely deliver our assets and operate our assets. So in that context, I think that we'll see year, two years from now what the change are. But as you go back to your companies and they ask you, so what did you see? What's new? I think one word is appropriate the use of rules to be able to, in fact, ensure that we're able to design a fit for purpose and a safe facility. So I think, uh, I think this is an important element. Again, safety has been the focus today, but please take away the technologies inherent in being able to address that and how Intergraph can do it. Uh, please join me in thanking the panel. Uh, very, very good discussion. Thank you. Good job. And uh, may you continue to have a fruitful and, yes, safe conference. Thank you.